Our second reading this morning is from Luke, chapter 10. And you can find this in the New Testament on page 71 if you would like to follow along. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord to harve- of the harvest to send out laborers into this harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, Your peace will rest on that person, but if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you, cure the sick who are there, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into the streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to your feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me. And whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your name be written in heaven. Amen. It is time for our young disciples. So you know who you are. I want you all up here. of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I now can see. Perfect present cleansing in the blood for me. Standing in the liberty where Christ makes free. Standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises. Standing on the promises. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing on the promises. Standing on the promises. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises. 
forces, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises. My standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing on the promises. Standing on the promises of God. I've often been a proponent of having a clock on the back wall of the church. Uh, not necessarily so that we know what time it is, but to know when it's time for the pastor to sit down. Uh, so, you know, just a, a timer with maybe a red light that comes on, say, okay, you're done, go ahead and sit down. That would be just fine. But, you know, I have something even better. I have my wife sitting over here. And uh, when she's heard enough, she'll just say, hey, we've heard enough, thank you so much. So, this is my job this morning, is to preach a small sermon. And I kind of uh, led into it in the, uh, in the children's sermon, because it concerns me that we don't teach our children the difference between right and wrong, good and evil. You know, they don't learn about uh, Christianity in school. So if they don't come to church, they don't get a grounding in the difference between good and evil and whether we should bother to actually make a distinction. So, so here is the few words of Scripture, and this is from Romans chapter 5, and I think about this a lot. Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand and we boast in our help of sharing the glory of God. And to me, that's the center of our faith right there. We are justified by faith. You know, in the Christian church, we like to think that we are justified by work. And that's just not the case. Um, you know, we work as hard as we like. We're Presbyterians, and especially the men who are good at keeping score in, uh, in all kinds of games, we tend to think that it's a point system, whereby when we do something good, we've actually scored a point from the, uh, for the good guys. And, uh, you know, when we get to heaven, there'll be a score sheet that shows how we did. That's not the case at all, okay? In fact, there's a show on TV, which I admit to watching, called The Good Place, and they actually use this point system to say whether you get into heaven or not, okay? And so the entire show is based on how you've lived your life and how this point system is keeping track of that. And there was a, there was a movie out there and I'm not sure I remember the title that well. It was something like Justifying Your Life. And uh, there was this poor sad guy who everything he did, it was one of these where if you don't quite measure up, you go back and you're reincarnated and you get another chance. And when you've reached a certain level, then you get on the train and go forward to eternal, eternal light, for example, whatever. Okay, and this poor guy was destined to uh, always be sent back because whatever happened, he was on the wrong end, he was on the losing end, he was getting killed or run over or dropped out of a building or whatever. And it was just the, the, the sadness of his life and the fact that he was trying to do better. Okay? But here, here's, the, here's the good news of Christianity. It doesn't matter how many times we fall down. It doesn't matter how many mistakes we make. Jesus Christ offers us forgiveness. Okay? And this is the thing about forgiveness that I've always 
that I've always thought is, and you know I see this when um, somebody has murdered some other people and the family come out to say we've forgiven him. Well, you know, I'm not sure that he asked to be forgiven. Okay? If there's a murderer out there or somebody who's committed heinous crimes, if he asks Christ for forgiveness, then maybe that could be forthcoming. But if he stands there and says, I don't care, I'd do it again, then forgiving him is not really an option. Uh, Christ offers forgiveness, and we, and we always think that maybe it's unfair. And there are plenty of stories in the Bible that, that I've always had a problem with. The uh, prodigal son is a major example. We've got the eldest son, that would be me, who works hard, does everything you're supposed to do, does what his dad tells him to do, works in the field, blah, 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 spends years doing this, and yet here comes the other erstwhile son, that would be my brother, who, uh, who spends his life in dissolution, drinking, gambling, having just a good old time, always borrowing money and never paying it back. Um, and this other brother falls on hard times, as you were likely to do living that kind of life. And when the hard times come along, he thinks to himself, well, I'll just go back to my father and say, well, maybe I can work in the fields and, you know, at least I'll have some food because now I have nothing. Okay? <clears throat> when he gets back to his father and says, Father, I'm, forgive me, I was, I was wrong. I don't want to uh, retake my place as your son. I'm just happy to work as one of your slaves works. And the father said, no, let's have a feast. I am so happy you're home. And wait, I'm going, wait, hold on, wait, hold on just a second. I've been working all these years, and now you're having a feast because this other son, who's done nothing, has come home, and you're having a feast in his name. Well, unfortunately, that's the way Jesus Christ works, okay? You can spend your whole life being a fairly bad person, being an awful, terrible person, and if you ask Jesus Christ to forgive you, he's going to forgive you. Now, before you start thinking, oh, this is great, I'll just live a terrible life until my last day, and then I'll ask Jesus to forgive me and I'll be in heaven, no problem. Uh, it doesn't work like that because there's the insincerity. You've already planned, you're trying to game the system, and God will forgive you because you've asked for his forgiveness on your last day. It doesn't work like that. Now, the other example that always comes to my mind is when Jesus was on the cross. He was nailed to the cross, crucified, and on either side of him, two really bad people were being crucified. They were nailed to crosses as well. And they were being executed for their crimes. And one of these guys, after a lifetime of murdering people, just taking what he wanted, doing whatever he wanted to do, says to Jesus, forgive me. And Jesus said, today you'll be in heaven at my side. Because forgiveness is always available. So just so you all know, it's not a point system. There's no fairness to it. You can work as hard as you like, but that's not going to get you into heaven. Read this verse. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God. So we have faith in God. We ask Jesus Christ to save us. We ask him to forgive us. We ask him to lead us. Now, you know, when, uh, when they said, please stand up and make a sermon, I said, sure, I'm happy to do that. Uh, I love the Psalms. And so this is the Psalms, that 23rd Psalm always comes to me when I'm in trouble because... I pray a lot, God help me. God help me in times of trouble. And the new, uh, the new writings to the Old Testament tend to put it in words like, when you walk down a dark hallway, God is with you. And I'm going, yeah, I can walk down a dark hallway, that's really not doing it for me. But when the Bible says, when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, 
then I know that's when I need God with me because that is an image that I can't, uh, I can't avoid. I need Jesus for that. Thank you. Amen.